On September 14th, 2022, two privately chartered planes carrying approximately 50 people, all recent immigrants to the United States, landed on the island of Martha's Vineyard, Massachusetts, unannounced, except at most for the flight's notification to the local air traffic controller. The individual plaintiffs were among the immigrants on those planes. All of them were subject to the same pattern and practice of inducement and deceit in the days leading up to their arrival in Martha's Vineyard, orchestrated by defendant DeSantis and implemented by the other defendants. Near a migrant resource center in San Antonio, Texas, and in similar locales, the Doe defendants and other accomplices approached the individual plaintiffs and gained their trust by offering them items they needed, McDonald's gift cards and other seemingly minimal items. Under the auspices of acting out of the goodness of their hearts, the Doe defendants made false promises and false representations that if the individual plaintiffs and other class members were willing to board airplanes to other states, they would receive employment, housing, educational opportunities, and other like assistance at their arrival. The Doe defendants also told the individual plaintiffs and other class members that they would receive assistance with their immigration proceedings at their destination. In fact, Defendants had made no arrangements for employment, housing, educational opportunities, or other assistance for the individual plaintiffs or other class members. Defendants had not even notified any government or nonprofit entity that could provide such services that the individual plaintiffs and their class members would be arriving. Lacking work and shelter and in desperate circumstances, individual plaintiffs and other class members accepted the offer, relying on these promises. They agreed to board a plane at the invitation of total strangers because they trusted that the defendants would provide what they had promised. For many class members, the defendants collected copies of the class members' paperwork so they could confirm their immigration status met the ultimate ends of their scheme. If the class members' paperwork fit the bill, the defendants engaged in further acts to lure them into being objects of the defendants' political agenda. To induce the individual plaintiffs and class members' trust in them, the defendants provided what they purported to be their cell phone numbers so that the individual plaintiffs and class members could call them with any questions about the purported plan when they reached their destination. The defendants rounded up and sequestered the individual plaintiffs and other class members in hotel rooms while they gathered enough of them to fill two planes and carry out their scheme. This took days of work by the Doe defendants. The defendants intentionally sequestered the class members so they could not discuss the arrangement and reveal the inhumane scheme to any true good Samaritans, and so the class members would be less likely to leave or change their minds since they were being provided free housing while they waited. After enough immigrants had been rounded up, enough to fill two planes, the individual plaintiffs and other class members were transported by the Doe defendants to a private airstrip where they boarded the planes. The planes took off from Texas, and at some point during the flight, it was announced that they would be landing at Martha's Vineyard. While on the plane and right before landing, defendants provided the individual plaintiffs each with a shiny red folder that included other official-looking documents, including a brochure entitled Massachusetts Refugee Benefits and instructions for how to change an address with U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, a federal agency which oversees immigration, including Form AR-11, the Aliens Change of Address card. The brochure was manufactured by defendants. It echoed the type of false representation that had been given orally, including statements such as, During the first 90 days after a refugee's arrival in Massachusetts, resettlement agencies provide basic needs support, including assistance with housing, furnishings, food, and other basic necessities, clothing, and transportation to job interviews and job training assistance in applying for social security cards, registering children for school. The brochure had a separate section entitled Refugee Cash Assistance, which provides up to eight months of cash assistance for income-eligible refugees without dependent children who reside in Massachusetts. It had other sections that described targeted services for employment. This brochure was not prepared by the Massachusetts Office for Refugees and Immigrants or any other Massachusetts agency or immigration services organization. Gentle reminder that if you or I created a fraudulent document like this purporting to be a government agency, we'd probably be arrested and thrown in jail. Defendants manufactured the official-looking brochure, lifting language from the Massachusetts Refugee Resettlement Program, a government program with highly specific eligibility requirements for which no members of the putative class are eligible in order to buttress their false oral representations to plaintiffs in furtherance of the conspiracy. 
Before the flight, class members were told they were heading to Boston or Washington, D.C., but right before landing, they were informed they were in fact going to Martha's Vineyard, which is an isolated Massachusetts island just south of Cape Cod, reachable only by plane or boat. Once the individual plaintiffs and class members landed, it became clear that the promises made to induce them on the planes were in fact bold-faced lies. Defendants intentionally failed to inform anyone on Martha's Vineyard or anyone in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts that the individual plaintiffs and similarly situated class members would be arriving. Defendants also intentionally failed to arrange any of the services they had promised to the individual plaintiffs and class members. Defendants completely abandoned the class members. They did not travel with the class members or connect them to or arrange for any services on arrival. When those induced onto the planes disembarked in Martha's Vineyard, it turned out that no one was expecting their arrival and uncertainty quickly ensued. In Texas, the Doe defendants had given telephone numbers to plaintiffs and told them to call with any questions. But once the planes landed in Massachusetts, the defendants were suddenly nowhere to be found and unreachable by phone. Destitute, stranded, and immensely vulnerable, the individual plaintiffs and class members were faced with an uncertain situation in an unfamiliar location. They were left in the dark with nothing, on a tarmac, on an island. The individual plaintiffs and class members suffered economic, emotional, and constitutional harms as a result of defendants' intentional, reckless, and negligent conduct. Together, plaintiffs have suffered harms, the redress of which is incalculable, but at a minimum exceeds $75,000. That's for diversity jurisdiction, when you're suing between states. The next day, September 15th, defendant Florida Governor Ronald DeSantis assumed responsibility for the scheme and publicly stated that he had orchestrated the chartered flights as part of the state's relocation program targeting immigrants. Defendant DeSantis proclaimed, We are not a sanctuary state, and we will gladly facilitate the transport of illegal immigrants to sanctuary jurisdictions. DeSantis stated that he had funded the scheme out of $12 million appropriated by the Florida legislature to the Department of Transportation, and that he and his associates will continue to undertake similar transport until those funds are exhausted. To date, none of those defendants has provided the individual plaintiffs or class members with any of the employment, housing, or immigration assistance that they were promised. Then there's a paragraph on the situation in Venezuela. Both the Trump and Biden administrations have consistently recognized the crisis in Venezuela. It's a level four do not travel advisory due to crime, civil unrest, poor health infrastructure, kidnapping, terrorism, and wrongful detentions. The Justice Department found extraordinary conditions prevent Venezuelan nationals from returning to Venezuela in safety, including severe economic and political crises, which have an impact across sectors. Venezuelans face limited access to food, basic services, and adequate health care, and the deterioration of the rule of law and protection of human rights. Amnesty International found that crimes uh, against international law and human rights violations, including politically motivated arbitrary detentions, torture, extrajudicial executions, and excessive use of force, have been systematic and widespread. Now let's learn a little bit about the three individual plaintiffs who are representing the class. Plaintiff Yannick Doe was born in Venezuela. She, her husband, and their 11-year-old son and additional family members fled Venezuela around July 2022. They crossed the border near Piedras Negras in Mexico and immediately surrendered to federal officials at the border. She and her family were detained for approximately six days by immigration officials. She and her family are subject to ongoing immigration proceedings in Texas. She must appear in Texas for an immigration check-in next month and a court hearing in February of 2023. While they were at the shelter, Plaintiff Yannick Doe and her family encountered Defendant Doe Number 1, a woman who identified herself as Perla, who was asking people outside the shelter if they needed help. Doe Number 1 shared her phone number with Plaintiff, and Plaintiff called her. Doe Number 1 asked Yannick for a picture of Plaintiff's immigration notices. Plaintiff sent Perla the immigration notices for herself, her husband, and her son. This worried Plaintiff Yannick Doe, but since defendant had been kind and supportive, and because defendant was near the shelter and known to support recent immigrants, Plaintiff Yannick Doe believed that defendant was genuinely trying to assist her. Doe number one then picked Plaintiff Yannick Doe and her family up in a car, I guess, and took them to a hotel where the family stayed for approximately five days. 
Doe 1, Perla, and her associates told Plaintiff that if the family got on the flight she arranged, then Plaintiff would be provided with permanent housing, work, educational resources for her son, and help changing her address for immigration proceedings. Doe number 1 eventually arranged a shuttle to take them to the chartered flight. Plaintiff asked if she could go to New York, and defendant informed her that she would go to Washington, D.C. or another sanctuary state. During the flight, Yannett Doe learned the plane would be landing in Massachusetts. When the plane landed, she and her family did not have anywhere to go, and no one was waiting for them. Yannett Doe is concerned that an immigration judge will order her and her entire family deported in absentia if they are unable to keep their scheduled appointments in Texas. Since arriving in Martha's Vineyard, plaintiff Yannett Doe and her son have been in need of mental health support because of the ordeal. They felt helpless, defrauded, and desperate. She was crying. She felt anxious and confused. She suffered from lack of sleep and vertigo. They have suffered emotional and economic harm and irreparable harm to their dignity and autonomy. If they had known that Doe number 1 had not arranged for those things, they would not have accepted the offer. On to Pablo Doe who was born in Venezuela and fled with his two brothers. They have a similar story. They were approached by Doe defendants 1 and 2. They reassured Pablo that people were aware of their arrival and would be waiting for them. They offered numerous promises, money assistance, housing, immediate employment, food assistance, clothing, English classes, and legal assistance. So they agreed to travel... They stayed in a hotel for three days. They communicated with Doe number one using the phone number. The defendants made all the travel arrangements, and of course, no one was waiting in Martha's Vineyard. They also tried calling. Of course, that went unanswered. He felt anxious and confused after being defrauded, and they would not have accepted the services had they known that they were fraudulent. And a similar story with Jesus. He stayed in the shelter three nights, was approached by Perla. She told him she had helped many Venezuelans before. They gave him a $10 McDonald's gift card. In, he, had to, he had to fill out a form to get the gift card. He, was, he received no explanation of what he was signing. He was also promised permanent housing, stable employment, help with immigration, and of course he realized that those promises were fraudulent. He tried to call, no answer, and similar damages. So it's a class action suit, pretty simple class. It's going to be the people that this was done to. The causes of action are, are many. So the first cause of action is illegal seizure or false arrest. So that's a Fourth Amendment violation. The second cause of action is substantive due process, as in civil rights, 42 U.S.C. 1983. Equal protection is the third cause of action, 42 U.S.C. 1983. The fourth cause of action is a violation of federal discrimination statutes, and this would be no person shall be discriminated against on the ground of race, color, or national origin by any program receiving federal financial assistance. Fifth cause of action, the Supremacy Clause. This is a really interesting one. The Supremacy Clause says that the federal government has power over certain things and and the states don't get power over those things. So the Supremacy Clause mandates that federal law preempts state law and policy in any area which is reserved to the federal government by the Constitution, over which Congress has expressly or impliedly reserved authority, or where state law or policy conflicts and interferes with federal law. So the Constitution grants the federal government sole and exclusive power to regulate immigration. The sixth cause of action is procedural due process that they were due some kind of a hearing before being detained and, and deported to Massachusetts. The seventh cause of action is civil rights conspiracy. Yeah, seems like a conspiracy to violate someone's civil rights. The eighth cause of action is interesting. Part of the American Rescue Plan was funds assigned for specific purposes. The $12 million that the defendant state of Florida appropriated for defendants challenged conduct originated from the federal coronavirus state fiscal recovery fund and was therefore subject to its use restrictions. The conduct alleged herein is not among the authorized uses of such funds and 
DeSantis has stated that he plans to continue to use the funds, so it's an ongoing controversy. Ninth cause of action is false imprisonment. Tenth cause of action is fraud and deceit, so a misrepresentation that they relied on. Eleventh cause of action is intentional infliction of emotional distress. Yeah, it's clear that this was done because they want to hurt people. And negligent infliction of emotional distress. So even if it wasn't intentional, it's at least negligent. And they're asking the court to certify the class action, designate Yanet, Pablo, and Jesus as class representatives, declare defendants' conduct violates the U.S. Constitution and the federal and state's, state laws cited above, and join defendants from continuing to do this, and award compensatory emotional distress and punitive damages to the individual plaintiffs in, and the class in an amount to be thrown at trial, award attorney's fees and costs and other relief, and that is by Oren Selstrom, Ivan Espinoza Madrigal, Jacob Love, Miriam Albert, the Lawyers for Civil Rights, lawyersforcivilrights.org. Awesome. Great, great to see it. These are people. Look, I have a, a, a family member who is really against illegal immigration. And so I've had this argument a lot. And the thing that keeps coming up in these arguments is, well, why don't they go through the proper channels? Well, they did. The people who've been made victims here did go through the proper channels. So it's one thing to point to the ongoing problem of illegal immigration, and you'll get no resistance on this side of the screen that it's a problem that needs to be addressed. How we address it is complicated because we, the United States, have made it intentionally difficult for people to immigrate from the Middle and Southern America countries. But these are people seeking asylum or seeking refugee status coming from a more or less uh, torn country, a more or less failing civilization in their country. So they deserve our sympathy and our empathy, and they certainly deserve the protection of the laws of the U.S. Constitution when they have followed the rules and laws of the U.S. Constitution. It's really hard for me to see any other way about this. This seems to be one of those things, these, those evil things that's done to hurt people in order to score political points. And it's done by people who claim to be virtuous religious followers of Christianity. Truly, I say to you, that which you do for the least of these, my brethren, you do for me. I'm calling them chinos. They're Christians in name only. They're using these brown-skinned people to score political points, and they're hurting them in the process, which it's one thing to not hurt somebody, but it's another thing to cause injury and there are children and families involved. It's one of the more heartless things I've been seeing recently, and it needs to be addressed, which is why I'm here. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Thanks for watching! Special thanks to my top supporters in September, John Steele, Evie, Spirit Bear, Ugly Grill, Torpedon, Gut Broge, Pure Magma, Eric Tams, Tech Tech Potato, The Blood Soaked Survivors, Wyatt Calandro, King Ares, and Kyle Seafring. You can support Lawful Masses on Patreon.com slash LJFrench, Sponsus.com slash Law, through YouTube memberships, and through Floatplane subscriptions. Join me for my weekly live production stream on Twitch.tv slash Lawful Masses on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. Eastern U.S. time. I hope everyone has a great week. I love you all. Bye.